You're listening to United Podcast, the official podcast of Man United Zone. Hello and welcome back to United Podcast. I hope to all our listeners, wherever you are in the world, Africa, Europe, Asia, wherever it is, I hope you're staying safe and I hope we'll be through this and football will be back with us before too long. However, in the meantime, I wanted to take a look at where football could be going in the next five to ten years, where I see the next big tactical shift coming from. In recent years in England, we've seen the shift from the 4-4-2, which was the main system used in England by pretty much every team for a long time, until um, Jose Mourinho's dominance um, around Europe with the 4-2-3-1, brought the 4-2-3-1 to England. And now Pep Guardiola has been so good at Barcelona um, for a long time, useful at Bayern as well, and he's now brought a different game plan to England. It's the 4-3-3 with uh, rather than two deep centre mids and one more attacking, you've got one holding centre mid and two that can roam forwards and really create chances for the strikers. To help explain where I see the game going, I think it's really helpful to take a look back at the past and see the recent evolutions in football um, tactics and the way teams have set up. So going back to the humble 4-4-2, it's really easy for players because everyone understands their role. In terms of getting a defensive setup, if everyone knows exactly what they've got to do, it's very, very easy. If you look at Atletico Madrid, they still play the 4-4-2, one of the few teams to still do so. And defensively, they are one of, if not the best team in Europe. In addition to being easy for the players, the 4-4-2 is also great for managers because it's a very well-balanced formation. It covers the pitch very, very well. And in a different game situation, such as if you're leading and you need to see out the game, you can take off a striker to bring on a centre-back or a centre-midfielder as you need to. The 4-4-2 era was the era of strike partnerships. You had um, sort of the big man, little man idea. You had two complete centre-forwards. Uh, one good example would be Andy Cole and Dwight York. Fantastic duo for Manchester United, as many of you will have grown up seeing and know. However, eventually, the 4-4-2 had to evolve. Jose Mourinho had great success um, in his time in Europe and then brought the 4-2-3-1 to England with Chelsea. His team that season was so good that everyone else tried to copy that management style, tried to copy his 4-2-3-1, and this marked a decline in the use of the 4-4-2. In changing from the 4-4-2 to the 4-2-3-1, you changed two complete centre-forwards into one complete striker who knows when to run the channels, when to get in behind and when to hold up the ball. The best examples of this for me at the moment would be Robert Lewandowski and Jamie Vardy. The role of wingers has also changed. From wide midfielders in the 4-4-2 that would be expected to put in crosses and create chances for the two centre-forwards, it's now a case that the wingers have to be genuine goal threats in and of themselves. The role of wingers is something that's also really developed in Europe recently. If you look at the evolution of Messi under Guardiola at Barcelona, he's um, when he's playing off the right, he's coming inside to get on the end of chances. Look at David Villa as an inside forward, a genuine goal threat all the time. Other examples of wingers being goal threats would be Aiden Hazard, Gareth Bale, Marcus Rashford this season, and Anthony Martial think his debut goal against Liverpool. This marked shift in the role of wingers helps to make up for the attacking threat lost by replacing two strikers with one. Just by way of a comparison, if you look at Mo Salah's stats, in 2017-18 he scored 32 goals in the Premier League, in 2018-19 he scored 22 goals in the Premier League. Um, You compare that to David Beckham, in the league season he only once scored over 10 goals in the league. And now, since he's the archetypal player for me, of what a wide midfielder should be in a 4-4-2, That shows the change in attitudes, change in role required of a winger in the new era of football. As well as the shift in attitudes and role for wingers, it's been necessary also for the fullbacks to become more of an attacking threat. Now, clearly when the wingers are now expected to get in the box and get on the end of chances themselves, you're going to need someone else to be putting the crosses in. And fullbacks in recent years have taken up that mantle and um, overlapping attacking fullbacks have become a feature of all the top teams in Europe. If you look at Barcelona, they've had Dani Alves and Jordi Alba for many years. Real Madrid, Carvajal often gets forward. Juventus, Alexandro is fantastic going forward. And you look at Liverpool this season, obviously um, Alexander-Arnold and Andy Robertson have got a lot of assists for them. Manchester United, um, Aaron Wambasak is becoming better and better going forward. And as I'm sure many United fans will want me to point out, Aaron Wambasak has actually created more chances from open play than Trent Alexander-Arnold this season. 
So this just about covers the evolution from the 4-4-2 to the 4-2-3-1 that happened in the mid-2000s in English football. The next big shift in football to consider is the shift from the 4-2-3-1 to the 4-3-3 in the way that Guardiola plays it. Pep Guardiola's philosophy and style of play has long been admired around Europe. That's come as no surprise to anyone. But what has come as a surprise is how easily he was able to adopt this in the Premier League. After a first season where there were some defensive hiccups and issues, he was able to take his Manchester City team to getting over the 100-point mark, something which seemed previously unthinkable for any team to achieve. Now, clearly, when a team is able to play such eye-catching football and be so successful with it in terms of getting the results, this throws up an entirely new benchmark for other teams to try and match. The basic principles behind Guardiola's play, such as playing out from the back and keeping the ball, are things that are being seen increasingly at lower levels now, with more emphasis on playing good football as opposed to playing effective football. However, at the top level, as well as the basic principles, the actual shape and formation which Guardiola's playing are being adopted into more and more teams. For many top teams which had adopted the 4-2-3-1 system, when you're playing in league games against teams much lower in the league, you don't need two defensive midfield players. You'd rather have more attacking impetus and be able to rack up more goals against teams that often like to sit deep against you and try and grind out for a draw. This marks the second big shift in football in recent years. Going from a midfield structure of having two deep-lying sitting midfielders with one attacking midfielder in front to going to one holding midfielder with two midfielders that can really create chances and influence the game from an attacking perspective. Now, this inverting of the triangle has been so crucial in allowing top clubs in England and in the rest of Europe to play the attacking football that their fans so desperately want to see. Guardiola likes to play with two eights in front of his holding midfielder. Kevin De Bruyne and David Silva have played this role really well in recent seasons, and the reason that they're so much more effective at breaking down defences is because they're that much closer to the opposition's goal. When you've got two players as creative and as brilliant as Kevin De Bruyne and David Silva on the ball, having them closer to the defence gives the defence less time to react to the movements of Manchester City's forwards, and um, gives De Bruyne and David Silva more opportunities to feed the ball through to them. Being that much closer to goal also allows De Bruyne and David Silva to crack off their long shots when they get the chance, which are always also a goal threat. This in turn means that teams can't afford to back off David Silva and De Bruyne too much because their long shots are a genuine goal threat, and they also can't afford to go too tight because if it will leave space for other attacking players of Manchester City. Finally, this allows City to create overloads on either side because they've got De Bruyne, one, whoever's playing striker, the winger and possibly the fullback who can all team up on one side and David Silva, uh, the striker coming across, the winger and fullback on the other side which means that City can pretty much at will create an overload whenever they want to. Overall, this gives them much more control of the midfield and a much greater attacking threat. Now, the main change here is moving a defensive midfielder from Mourinho's system into an attacking midfielder within Guardiola's system. As before, when two strikers were converted into one, the one that remains must become more complete. Rather than in Mourinho's system having one defensive midfielder who sits and one who's given a bit of licence to go a little bit further forward, you now have an anchor man in Guardiola's system who has to be both good at intercepting and putting out fires and become the distributor for their team, keeping things ticking over, making the simple passes to the more advanced, more creative players. Also, to give that central midfielder a little bit more support in the middle of the park, Guardiola has often played with inverted fullbacks, which helps to stop counter-attacks and provides another body in the middle of the park, as well as giving a different angle of pass out to the um, forward players. The other way that Guardiola copes with the decrease in solidity from removing one of the defensive midfielders is by making sure that City restrict the amount of times during a game where the opposition can have a quick transition. By quickly and aggressively pressing whenever they lose possession, City often either make a tactical foul or win the ball back, preventing dangerous situations where their players aren't able to get back quick enough and therefore they end up conceding a goal-scoring chance. Now, that explains the second recent evolution in football tactics and how, by moving players about the pitch, from making two roles into one role, teams have been able to gain another body in the midfield area, which is so crucial, especially in big games. Now this brings me on to where I see football going in the next 5-10 to ten years. We've seen the attackers condensed, we've seen the midfield condensed, and now I think we'll start to see the defence being condensed. 
I think we'll start to see the roles of two separate centre-backs condensed into one, especially for the big teams. For most big teams, they're expected to dominate possession in most games. And if you dominate possession, normally the opposition will play with long balls and look to, um, get, look to get at you on the counter-attack. Now, in these situations, full-backs are becoming more and more adept at defending one-on-one. If you look at Luke Shaw's rise at, um, recently at Manchester United, he slotted very well into a left centre-back role as well as a left-back role when needed as well. This additional um, improvement in his defending shows that he's more than capable of taking on a winger one versus one. Look at Aaron wan He's also more than capable of taking on a winger 1v1. And that leaves the centre of the park. With most teams playing now with one striker up top, it makes sense that a complete centre-half, someone like um, Virgil van Dijk or Kaladu Koulibaly, would be able to man-mark a striker. This means there's not much extra need for a secondary centre-half alongside him, and this position can be instead moved to a defensive midfielder. This defensive midfielder's role would be to work as essentially a sweeper just in front of the back four. He's able to step into the back line when needed, but most of the time will act as a second midfielder, alongside the anchor man in a more defensive role. This player would operate alongside the existing anchor man and would be expected to cover the spaces left by the fullbacks going forward. Um, obviously in this system, rather than having both fullbacks pushed up at the same time, you'd only push one up at a time. This new midfielder would allow an extra body in the middle of the park, it would help teams to control possession. It allows you to have two defensive midfielders and two attacking midfielders, essentially getting the best out of both Mourinho's system and Guardiola's system. Obviously there'd be some defensive concerns with the system, so I'm now going to address those concerns. The two phases of play that will be the problem would be a defensive transition, when your team has lost the ball and the opposition are looking to break, and the defensive phase, where you're set up in a defensive shape and the opposition have possession of the ball. As I've explained earlier, on defensive transitions, the main two ways that teams attempt to break down the opposition um, as they win the ball back quickly are either through one direct long ball, which the um, modern day fullback should be more than capable of uh, cutting out and getting rid of, and so should the complete centre back that I'm advocating would play the uh, central role in this new system. And the other way is by running at the opposition. And given fullbacks increasing um, dominance in 1v1 duels with wingers, think about Wan-Bissaka and Luke Shaw again here, it's not unreasonable to suggest that the fullbacks should be able to beat those wingers in those duels and stop counter-attacks coming from that fashion. In addition, in terms of helping out the press so you can win the ball back quickly and try to restrict the defensive transition, you've got an extra body in midfield who can be used to go forwards, commit and um, try and either squeeze the opposition into a small area so you can win back the ball or commit a tactical foul, slow the game down and allow the team to drop back. The main concern with this system defensively would be the defensive phase. When the opposition have possession of the ball and your team is set up deep Um, trying to defend and stop the opposition from scoring. When a team have controlled possession like this against you, um, at the moment with the back four, it's often seen that teams like to play the ball to one winger, that winger plays that ball back to the centre midfielder, who then switches it out to the other winger. Now, when you've only got three in the back line, that is going to become even more of a problem, you would think. However, having that extra body in midfield just in front of the back line means that you can get up and press the opposition player who's looking to switch the ball more effectively, meaning there's less time to execute an accurate switch, and very often, when these switches a player attempted with minimal pressure, they are slightly overhit or slightly underhit, allowing the defending team to intercept or it goes out for a throw-in. With the additional pressure applied from having another midfielder in that area, another defensive midfielder in that area, you'd think that it would be much, much less likely that these switches a player would be successful. Also, To make up for the shortfall on the far side, you would have the winger dropping back a little bit further defensively just to cover the space so that the switch is less of an option. This of course assumes that, as is the case at the moment routinely, the um, opposite side fullback would be tucking in slightly to um, cover the extra space in the centre of the park. So, with this joint approach of having the winger on the opposite side drop a little bit further back when it looks like the switch might be on, in addition to having an extra energetic midfielder getting up in the faces of the opposition and pressing hard to avoid that switch happening, this switch would not become a problem for teams defensively. What this system brings defensively is an extra body to play through before you get to the defensive line, 
and in attack it gives you an extra body in the middle of the park to help you control possession, open up more spaces and create chances. It combines the triangles of both Mourinho and Guardiola into what you could see as a, effectively a square. So I've talked about Koulibaly and Van Dijk as examples of the sort of players that would fill the lone centre-back role. Now it makes sense to talk about examples of players who'd fill this new midfield role. Now clearly you look at players like N'Golo Conte, Blaise Matuidi, Wilfred Ndidi, Idrissa Gay for PSG now. Uh, that sort of player would be fantastic for this system because they're very fast, very energetic, run around a lot. And the Herrera, for example, as well. These players are mobile. They add extra quality to the midfield in possession. But defensively, they're able to deal with all the different types of threats that they'll be needing to counter. They'll be able to get up very quickly and press the um, player looking to pull off a switch. They're intelligent enough to know when they need to step into the back line if they have to. They're good enough that they can, um, when the centre-back is marking a striker who's posting up for a header trying to win a flick on, that centre mid, um, Kante, Matuidi, Idrissa Gay, and Herrera, they, they're good, they've got good enough awareness and anticipation to know where that ball's going to drop, get there, and move the ball onwards, starting an attack for their team. Now, this is something that uh, many of you will disagree with, but this is where I see football going in the next five to ten years. Please do let me know your thoughts in the comments, whether or not those thoughts be, this will never work, this is a good idea. Whatever you happen to think about it or whatever you see, please let me know. Um, thank you again for those of you who tuned in, whether it be on Spotify or YouTube. Hope you enjoyed it and hopefully football will be back soon.